getting started. Here we go. As you can see, there are 200, well, no, you can't see because I'm looking at the sneaker things or sneak presenter notes, but there's 213 slides. So if you're all like, Laura, stop talking. This is too much. Just put your hand up or pizza will come and interrupt us. So, okay, algorithms in CSS. Let's get started. This is version 3.0.0. There should be like an, a dash beta after that because this is major beta. Um, so like I said, kind of when I was introducing myself, uh, I started giving this talk last year and it's gone from algorithms of CSS. So I initially presented this as a uh, proposal to like bridge the gap between CSS and computer science. And over the last year or so that's turned into like, whoa, no, CSS, like I'm writing algorithms in CSS. Let's talk about that. So how many of you have heard, how many of you have heard something like this? CSS doesn't scale. This is one of the, the key arguments for the CSS and JS, uh, um, or just kind of CSS critics, or do people even write CSS anymore? This is all Twitter speak from various threads, or CSS isn't a real programming language. Okay, I've heard that one. So, March of 2018, I decided to get a final answer by posting a Twitter poll, because that's a great way to get a solid amount of data. Um, so I was like, okay, let's see what Twitter thinks. Um, is CSS a programming language? Well, Twitter says no. So we got 41% yes, or rather 42% yes. 50% um, no and 8% I'm not sure. This is only 129 votes here. But then I posed this question again in November and had a few more votes, like 1300 votes this time. Pretty similar, similar uh, measure here. So, and this will be another poll that I will post recently because I want to see if this changed. Um, so in the in the responses to this thread, they were they were kind of like, I don't really consider CSS programming language. Like you can't call CSS programming. You're like it's not really like. Mm, and I was like, mm, what's going on? This seem these seem very like opinion based. So let's ask like, what is a programming language? And people follow up with, well, I think. This is a, so people all have their kind of personal definitions for what constitutes programming language. Um, however, there are decades and decades of research about programming languages and what they are. And because there is, because the world of computing and of programming is so large, the, the definition is very vague. So like a language of instructions for a computer. Um, and programming languages are broken down into programming paradigms. So we have, an imperative paradigm, which is how, where you're, it's a language and you're, you're writing how a computer should do, to, should perform a computation or should uh, execute a task. And then declarative languages where you write code telling the computer what to do. And the difference here is control flow versus no control flow. So control flow is the order of execution of the statements and no control flow is kind of top to bottom, you said what, exactly what to do. And that's the declarative paradigm. These are the two major categories of programming languages. Um, an imperative is what we usually think of. So JavaScript, Ruby, C++, Python, um, and declarative languages are a little more uh, esoteric, so to speak. So a lot of times they're domain specific. Uh, SQL is a declarative programming language. Um, HTML is a domain specific declarative programming language if we're using this definition. Um, and CSS, of course, is part of this category of programming languages. CSS is a domain-specific declarative programming language. Aha, Twitter, 100%. And so the response to this is like, oh, that's just semantics. I'm like, oh, what? Like, that's what, it, that's, that's what it is. And then I'm like, why does this bother me so much? Why do I care who thinks CSS is a programming, pro bleh, programming language? What's the big deal? Because this sentiment, this CSS isn't a real programming language, is not a far cry from CSS isn't worth my time, which is not a far cry from CSS doesn't matter. And that is incorrect. Because if you say CSS doesn't matter, then you fall into a cycle that I like to call turd-driven development. <laughs> okay. In CSS. Okay, so this is... On, uh, kind of operating under an assumption here that when you write code, 
all code is crap at first. Like any, no matter what code you write, like you can't write it the right way the first time. It's never going to be good. Um, so there's a cycle of programming called test-driven development where you start with a test here. But in CSS, we can't really write unit tests in the same way that you can in other languages. So you can kind of say the design is the test. And passing is does what does the code you wrote match the design? So, okay, yes, I wrote some CSS for the first time. It matches the design. Great. So then some time goes by. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, cool. Our design, our, it works. Our UI is there. Great. Um, but then the design changes. So we want to add a new feature. So what happens now? We write more CSS. And maybe that's fine. Or maybe it causes a regression. So then we go back and write more CSS to fix the regression because we can't really remember what happened last time and it wasn't written that well to begin with. But okay, now it's working. Now it's okay. And so some more time passes. And then, oh, a new feature comes. Well, what do we do? We need to add, we need to update our code, right? More CSS. I think I'm missing a slide here. Um, then a regression, more CSS. You got the idea. And now our, now our test and our design itself is starting to like not look as good because everything's hacked together. Like it's not really systematically thought out because we're just writing CSS and we keep writing more and more CSS and maybe having this period of waiting in between. And it's like, oh, new feature. Okay, more CSS. Regression, more CSS. Over and over and over and over and over again until, oh my God, what do we do? I can't even get the design to, I can't even get the, the UI to look how it's, I can't even implement this new feature. So, and this is something at my job bef before I started and saved everyone. Um, <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. Uh, these little th things that should be so easy end up taking forever because of ridiculous CSS issues. So what do we do? Like, ah, oh, this is so bad. So, I don't know, that's kind of the premise of my talk. And like my thing now is like, stop writing CSS. Stop just writing and writing CSS and start programming boxes because everything on the web is a box. And CSS is a domain specific language for programming boxes, essentially. So stop writing CSS with a hammer. Start writing CSS with a whiteboard marker. And part of that is thinking about CSS as a programming language and acknowledging that it is a programming language because there are these huge consequences if you do not treat it like a programming language. Okay. All right, so this is a placeholder slide. So if you see slides that are like chicken scratch such as this, they will be refined. Um, I also changed the order of these things. Okay, so kind of go, go over some three points here. What is a programming language? So I wanna address some common uh, responses to this question that I've heard. Uh, so what is programming language? A programming language is Turing complete. So Alan Turing in 1936, kind of widely regarded as the first programmer and one of the key individuals that is responsible for how we write code today. And he invented what's called a Turing machine. And the Turing machine was invented to do math. So the idea was that you could write a sequence of steps and this machine could perform any computation. The goal was to perform math or to solve math problems and it was kind of this big long strip of ones and zeros and you would write instructions and kind of go back and forth between the ones ones and zeros and so all modern digital devices are based on this concept still which is pretty amazing so when we say something is turing complete that means it can simulate a turing machine and it can hypothetically or for all intents and purposes can solve any computable math problem. And then you kind of break down the rules of Turing complete to conditional branching. So you need to have that option for one and zero. And then also the uh, option for arbitrary memory. So the program could, in theory, run forever. Um, but this is kind of discarded because we're limited by physical things like atoms in the universe. Uh, so that can kind of be uh, discarded for Number two, so there's an abstract math model call, uh, called Rule 110, and that is a Turing complete machine. So the idea of Rule 110 in these abstract uh, automata, automata they're called, um, is it's a kind of visual representation of a, a machine. And Rule 110 
is a machine that is Turing complete. So the thought is if you can program rule 110 in a programming language, then it is Turing complete. So you can do this with CSS. And here is a YouTube video of someone else who built it. Um, let's see if this plays at all. I don't know if we can play it. Why? Or is it playing? No. Oh, there we go. It's still not my thing. Um, it's very exciting. So if you consider, if you allow for user input and HTML as part of the means of executing a program in CSS, then it is uh, Turing complete and can, can do rule 110. And I think for a domain specific language that is built for building user interface, um, allowing user input is acceptable. But of course I'm a very biased person. Um, okay, this is a code pen of the code for this, which maybe we'll just look at it quickly because it's kind of ridiculous. And just goes to show you like CSS is not really intended to do math like this. Um, a little fuzzy here, but this. So it's essentially using a checkbox for a lot of the logic. And then there are these like pretty incredible sibling chain selectors for each of the rows. So it's not a uh, like automatically doing, you have to kind of build out the board. Um, however, this was this implementation of it was done in like 2013, I think, and CSS can do a lot more things now. So if I have time at some point, I'll be like, okay, let me make a Turing machine, but not yet. Um, okay. Do, do, do. Back to present. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, those are our rules. So here's a fun fact. You know what else is Turing complete? Apache rewrite rules. The game mechanics of Pokemon Yellow. The game mechanics of Magic the Gathering. Excel. There are like, there's a really great blog post called Accidentally Turing Complete. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> so it's kind of like, if you're on a computer in 2019, if, and it's a system that runs on a computer, it very well might be Turing complete. Um, CFS isn't solving math, but it could. So the idea of CSS as a programming language, we can think of the browser as an interpreter. So usual, um, more traditional languages, you have the language itself, and then you have a compiler. So I'm writing my English, uh, C++, whatever, and the compiler turns that into machine readable code that can be executed by the machine. So an interpreter is something that, this is gr like grossly generalizing, and I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but an interpreter versus a compiler does more than just translate it into uh, machine readable code. So an interpreter might have some other program that's happening um, in the middle. And if anybody has, a, uh, that doesn't sound accurate, let me know. Um, okay, so. If we have the browser as our interpreter, um, the browser also contains this imperative backbone of our declarative code. So all declarative code is essentially like a bunch of function calls to a um, to a system underneath. So CSS is up here and Rust and C++ or whatever the browser source is written in is down here. And something I've t taken a liking to is browsing browser source code, which is very interesting coming from the side of knowing the declarative the declarative code so well as a CSS specialist developer um, it's really interesting to browse through the source and to rec and follow the traces and be like oh that's how like flex wrap works I can really see it and you can read the code so this is the uh, github repository for servo which is the rendering engine in Firefox and here's a little a little bit of CSS. So display flex, flex wrap, wrap. And if we kind of follow this path, the little cookie crumbs in, in Servo to see where this happens, um, we see something like this. So this is very much abbreviated, but this is in flex, the flex rust file inside of the layout directory. And we're like setting up some stuff here. So like is wrappable, yes or no. Um, 
and then oh, comparative rust. And then in here, you can see see the the logic. So flex what flex wrap does for anyone not familiar, you set display flex on a container and all of its children will become flex items and they behave in a certain way. And kind of the default behavior is like everything squishes together onto one flex line. And if you say wrap, then the elements will wrap to a new line, kind of creating a new line. So that is what this this little programming is, this little algorithm. So you have um, like if total line size plus outer main size, so the total size plus um, any additional margin is greater than the container size, and and it does not equal start self and self is wrappable then break so we're breaking out of the loop and creating a new line and so if css is something if this is a more familiar language to you to read through this kind of stuff it's not out of the question to go look up the source of it just like you would in any other framework <clears throat> speaking of frameworks react is a declarative framework for javascript and we can follow the same process so it's kind of like look into what these tools are that we're using and you can absolutely find something that fits into your mental model. So React on GitHub. Um, here's a little tiny bit of React. I haven't done a lot of React. This was a, I was like, oh, hmm, okay. I can figure out what this is. Um, dangerously set inner HTML, which they intentionally put the word dangerously there so people would not use that as much or uh, be aware of it because it's a security concern when you're injecting HTML because it opens your site up for um, malicious like cross-site scripting. So dangerously set in HTML. It's like, okay, I go to the GitHub repository, search for that, and I can follow the cookie crumbs and find the source for dangerously set in HTML. Um, and so I'm in here and then I see, okay, set in HTML. What's in set in HTML? And then I follow that down to something I've written, like code I've written before, dot in HTML. Declarative. Okay. What is a programming language? A programming language has smells, code smells. How many people are very, are aware of code smells? We actually spend some time combating code smells. Um, these are some stand-in slides for smelly CSS to hopefully make everybody cringe a little bit, but they're not here yet. Some uh, outcome of turd-driven development very sad. Um, but let's change the tune a little bit and talk about test-driven development. So this is a practice that maybe is not that common to follow totally well, but even if you don't religiously subscribe to test-driven development, even just a little bit of that style of thinking can help your code a lot. So again, our assumption is all code is crap at first. Anytime you write it, it's going to be crap. So the idea behind test-driven development is you start with a failing test. So you write a test, say my code needs to do X. Um, and then you write your crap code to make it do X. And then you don't stop and wait for a new thing to come up. You refactor the code. And then maybe your test fails. And so you, or you need to add some more. Uh, it's time to like start build out, building out the feature a little bit more. So then you write some more code. Um, then you refactor, and this is the like extremely utopian version of test-driven development, where your code morphs into a beautiful flower and stays that way forever. Probably doesn't happen very often, but that's the idea. Um, and the thing is with how we write CSS, and if you don't treat CSS like a programming language, we completely skip this step. So it's like the missing piece, refactoring CSS. It's like you wait until your style sheet is eight megabytes and slowing down everything and there's so much time and engineering effort being lost in fixing these CSS mistakes to to either refactor all of it or just burn it down and write a new one um, instead of refactoring incrementally as we go. So I've been reading this book, Clean Code. Has anybody read this before? Okay, so this is by someone, Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, who is one of the founding um, founding folks in Agile software development. So Agile can often be associated with um, just the project man management side of like working in sprints, but there's also a lot of software development methodologies behind Agile. Um, and Uncle Bob also came up with this, uh, or so a lot of principles around object-oriented object -oriented programming. So I forgot to make a title slide for this, but this is going to be an example of the open-closed principle. 
So, mm, I, like I need a better transition here. Um, okay, Coffee Maker. So this is a made up programming language, pseudocode, Lara code, um, kind of, well, object oriented. So if you have a class Coffee Maker, And these are some things that I'm, I'm a big fan of coffee and very particular about it. So this could be a real life program that would work for me well. Uh, coffee maker. So we do a few things. Buy coffee, grind beans, boil water, brew the coffee. What happens when I need to change the size of my grind? Because I have a nice grinder and I like to make the coffee very particular. And for certain types of coffee, you need to have a different grind setting or for certain brew met methods. So I might add some logic into my grind beans method here inside my coffee maker class. So grind beans, if it's a Chemex, set the grinder to 20, otherwise set it to 14. Okay, that's fine, boil the water, continue on. But then what if I want to make an AeroPress coffee now? Then I add more logic into my class coffee maker. So the idea of the open closed principle is a class is open for extension, but closed to modification. So right now I'm modifying my main class. So we can refactor this code to be more, op more open for extension, closed for modification, which is one of these uh, kind of agile principles and development philosophies that uh, and in clean code that can help code bases scale and be resilient over time. So I can make my grind beans class, and this is in my made up programming language. This is how I would uh, make that, that method available to be overridden, available to be extended. And then I make a few different classes for each of the methods here. So now I can extend Coffee Maker, and I can still take advantage of the stuff that's in Coffee Maker, but I can override a certain thing. OK, so this is an object-oriented programming principle. Let's look at what this concept is in CSS. So I have a box, nice box, blue box. And I want to make the box bigger. I want to make one of the boxes bigger. So I could, I, if I just have one box, then I can add my, increase the height and width in there. But what if I want this to be like the box that this, this code, this system can make any box ever. So I don't want to edit what's inside the box selector here or inside the box rule set here, but I can make an extension of it. So I say box dash dash bigger with height um, a little bit larger. And this inheritance we get for free with the cascade. So because this code is after the initial box, I can overwrite those two properties and I can call this um, and I call this on my instance of the box in my HTML here. Um, what if I want to make a smaller box? Box smaller. Okay. So cool. That's great. This is my initial crap code. <clears throat> Let's refactor this a little bit to be more CSS in 2019 with a custom property. The coolest things ever. Who's used a CSS variable, variable or custom property before? Yeah, they're very, I've had some good success. So essentially a custom property, um, AKA CSS variable, is a uh, custom property. You create a new property in, um, in CSS. So every one of these, like width, height, box shadow, bo background color, those are all properties. And so I'm registering a new one called box size and I can store a value in that box size. So now instead of redeclaring width and height, I can reassign the value in box size. So I have this like really nice little scaffold um, at the top in box and I can extend it uh, with less code. And it's, you know, pretty readable. And also, uh, also more, more closed, like much more closed off. So I don't need to worry about someone making a box that is actually, you know, a rectangle, even though box is a little vague of a word. Oh, also I think, I think I had, I meant to rename this to badge. So pretend, pretend this is badge. Okay, um, bigger box, smaller box, cool. Okay, so here, this code already is starting to smell a little bit to me. Does anybody have an idea of why it might be smelly?
I mean, it's like pretty taken out of a real world. Oh wait, no, sorry, I'm, I'm missing a thing. Here's another another part error handling. So this is a uh, some fallback styles for older browsers if they don't support uh, custom properties. So IE 11 and sub IE 11 do not support custom properties. So I can um, apply these fallbacks that will apply with the cascade, which is kind of cool. Uh, but the reason I would start to think this is smelly and I may need to update my example given that nobody else really thought it was smelly, but okay. Um, single responsibility principle. So this box is doing two things. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Here's my great illustration of a single responsibility principle. Ready? Go. Okay. Here are some kitchen tools. Here is a tool that does not follow the single responsibility principle, a spork. So the, these kitchen tools are very useful. Like the spoon is a spoon, whisk is a whisk. That's great. A spork, even though there's a restaurant named Spork in Pittsburgh, um, that's fine. Uh, I, I don't, I personally don't find a spork very useful. You're trying to do too much spork. So if we think about this um, in our badge, which is now a badge, uh, there's two things going on here. So badge, badge class, you're doing too much. But is it doing too much? So I started, I started doing some refactoring of this and I was like, wait, wait, hold on. Okay, here's my badge. Sorry, badge doing too much. I was like, okay, I can move those two declarations to a new little extender there. That's fine, box blue. But then I was like, wait a minute, what if I want an orange box? Am I gonna keep redeclaring background color and box shadow again when I can do this cool custom property stuff? So I was like, okay, move it back in there. Um, background color, box color, a box shadow and box shadow color. So I set a couple of new uh, properties up there and I can extend them um, in the same in a similar way. Major sidebar. How about Houdini? Has anybody heard of Houdini? Yeah, so so Houdini, I mean, not, not the magician. Uh, yeah, not the magician, but the, the browser project. Um, so Houdini is a set of JavaScript APIs that allow you to write um, essentially like write canvas style JavaScript that will, that you can call with a custom pro or with a, uh, value. So this value paint uh, or paint is a, sorry, paint is a function within CSS box is the name of the little worklet that I would have written. So all of this code, um, would be inside of box and that would be totally a, like away from the uh, normal flow of styles. So that would come from something else. And this is, this property is called at the paint, at the paint level in rendering. And I can customize it with custom properties. So this is like the future, probably kind of far away though. Um, okay, so back to single responsibility principle. Um, I just like blew that out of the water. Cause I was like, hey, wait, I can put this background in box out. Like this looks better with custom properties. Um, So this is where I was like, meh. I'm kind of noticing myself as I was writing my CSS, I was like, oh, single responsibility principle. Yes, this is great. But then I was like, no, but I could move back in here and this thing will be really nice and great. And the thing is with CSS in any programming language, we need to have discipline. So like there are these principles that we're supposed to follow and it might seem fine to make that call in the moment when you're like, this is gonna be the best box. Um, but as Alan Turing said, in 1945, one of our difficulties will be the maintenance of an appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. So the thing with CSS, and, and we, when we don't follow this single responsibility principle, when we build these like components that are maybe gonna be reusable, but they're doing so many things and they have names that are not, na they're not named in a way that's indicating what the programming is doing, but they're called like button or card or something that's based on the UI. So there's no way to keep track of what's happening in that component. So that doesn't really work for something more complex than a box. So this badge, for instance, which yeah, box badge, this is beta. Um, there are some declarations in here 
that I want to use on other uh, other elements. So a button, a circle, another other stuff, whatever else. Like this height and width, this fixed height and width pattern could be really useful in other areas of the site. But because all of that's locked away in something named badge, I can't pull that out and use it. So this is where uh, something I've been experimenting with is algorithms. So a fixed size square. That's what I'm going to call this algorithm. So that's a small, well-named function, which is a one of the cl classic clean code principles when you're writing, um, when you're writing, when you're developing. Naming is everything in a programming language. Okay, how are you? How are you all doing? Good. Should I keep keep going? Any any thoughts so far? This is like that was a rough section. A lot to do. So, I mean, this is helpful. Okay. Good. Keep going. Does anyone want to get water? Yeah. Okay. What is a programming language? You can write algorithms in a programming language is another definition I've heard. Look, okay. Let's talk about algorithms. How many of you all have done a whiteboarding algorithms interview? Yeah. Several. Okay. Um, how about, have you read the Thomas Corman book? Does anybody know that? Uh, so this is a book that's assigned in many a computer science 101 course. None of those courses have I ever taken, but I'm familiar with the book. Um, and he defines algorithm as well-defined computational procedure that takes input and produces output. Okay, so another pretty vague definition, but I like it. Let's use this framework for algorithms. So input, sorting is a very common use case for an algorithm. Input, unsorted numbers, output, sorted numbers. What happens in the middle? Our algorithm. So we have many sorting algorithms. Bubble sort, selection sort, merge sort, quick sort. I think a few more. And now it's time for name that sorting algorithm. This is not really that serious of a question unless someone knows it. Sort. What's that? Sort. No, I don't know what num sort is. This is not a performance sorting algorithm. Num sort goes through and swaps each one. Bubble sort. Same. I think oh, that's the same. That's yeah. Sort. Yeah, that might be the same thing. But yes, it's going through and just like, um, yeah. So this is a sorting algorithm. This is imperative JavaScript, of course. Um, and just kind of sidebar or comment here. If this were more declarative code, which there is a sorting method on array, I believe array dot, oh wow, pizza. Um, if this was a declarative code, we wouldn't know what the sorting algorithm is. We would just, all we would care about is saying sort. And that's what we do. So I, I believe in JavaScript, it's a, an implementation of merge sort. So let's think about boxes now. So programmers of boxes, CSS developers, Okay, here's our input is a stack of boxes. Our output be a row of boxes. Cool. So what could our algorithm be in between there? Any, anybody have a, a thought? Yeah. Display in line box. That would also work. But uh, yes, if it was on each of the boxes. Um, so yes, that's one option. Any others? Display twice. Yay. How about another one? Go ahead. You look like you're, no, okay. I don't know if it's actually a CSS thing, but I transpose. Transpose? Oh, I don't know what transpose is. Um, so there's probably a version of that in CSS somehow. Uh, float left, gasp. I'm trying not to use floats too much anymore, but okay. So here, here's our declarative CSS algorithm. Okay, um, back to our little great iceberg here. CSS on top, Rust, and C++ underneath. So what we're doing when we call display flex, we're really calling that big, huge algorithm that's determining where all the boxes are laid out underneath. Um, oh my God, so many algorithms in there in Rust. Can we write CSS algorithms? Like, can you call this an algorithm? I don't know. So I'm like, why not? <laughs> So let's have let's new transition to the talk. Algorithms 101, CSS algorithms 101, domain specific, 
declarative. Okay, so this is the, I don't know, my, my thing now. Um, a CSS al algorithm is a well-defined declaration or set of declarations that produces a specific styling output. Story time. So instead of uh, getting into that much more, I'm going to give you a, an example, story example. When a CSS algorithm saved the day. Yay. Okay. So I am a design engineer at a company called Penske Media Corporation, PMC. And it's a big, big publisher um, with lots of like very highly trafficked websites. Um, depending on the day, sometimes I call myself a design ops engineer. And I love, definitely love my job. It's a lot of fun. And a big part of what I do is uh, design systems. So also known as design systems er which can also be translated to the first and only front end developer on a team of like 30 engineers. They've gotten pretty far without ever having an in-house front end person. There's a lot of scary stuff to work with. Um, and to make matters um, more interesting, all of our sites are on WordPress. So we don't, we don't use WordPress in a way where you kind of hunt for themes or look at templates, but it's like an enterprise level CMS. And we have a lot of custom software built around WordPress, but WordPress, it has like templating in WordPress and in PHP is very tricky to figure out a nice modular way to do that. So it's a lot of fun and interesting challenges. So I do love it though. Um, so one project recently that was kind of our design systems big bang was called Deadline, is called Deadline. So this is a picture of Deadline, homepage, lots of content. It's like Hollywood news stuff. I don't even know. Um, this is more accurately what Deadline's like ads okay so there is such a huge amount of ads on this and all of pmc sites also might see this for ads like literally you get log into the site and so, uh, I, okay that's another conversation so i see this pull request come in after the site's launched i'm like yes or does it, like all these system things are figured out like i'm really excited i see this pull request come in so this which you can't quite see but this is in the meta, uh, in a meta tag in the head, and it's saying initial scale 0.76, user scalable zero. So what this is doing is it's making the site three quarters of the size and removing the ability for a user to zoom. And I'm like, what the fuck? What is going on? What is like? What is happening? So it turns out the ad team. Um, was serving an ad at a tablet size, and the ad is bigger than the screen. And there's no way the campaign is already sold. The old site supported this. Um, there's nothing we can do. Like this has to the the campaign's running tomorrow. It has to happen. So I was like, okay, whatever. Um, and I'm like, this is like, what? I can't even. Um, so, but what happens with this little bit of code is we have our the tablet site, the tablet version of the site. And it turns into this, which is like, this is a different breakpoint. So the design of the site is supposed to be different at that, that size. And it actually activates the desktop breakpoint. And there's really tiny like menu text up there that you can't really read. This is terrible. So that solution, that's what that solution does. And there, if another proposition was to have some JavaScript that changes the meta tag um, only between certain device sizes, this is bad news bears. And so I'm like, okay, time for a CSS algorithm. And so here's my problem. Here's my kind of pseudo code. So my boxes, I'm thinking about my boxes as a programmer of boxes. Um, why don't I make the ad smaller instead of making the entire website smaller? <laughs> Scale 0.76, okay. Uh, I mean, this took a little, a little bit of finagling to figure out. There were some other, um, like, fixed menu issues with the drop-down video and, like, yada, yada. But this is our little our little algorithm here. And I have it as a, a little A. So um, our system has a lot of small namespaces. So in um, when you're working in design systems and kind of scaling CSS for bigger sites, it's very common to see these one-letter namespaces that indicate what set, what kind of styles that is. So... Um, for my like algorithms experiments, I use A, and I have a nice long descriptive name here. So A scale for header leaderboard ad, 
there's no mistaking what this little set of code is doing and it is also not part of the header code so it's very clear what this is and nobody's going to add a i mean i hope no i hope like um nobody's going to add like display properties in here or colors like why would you add color blue to scale for header leaderboard ad um and a cool thing two days later this was deployed on a different brand another a site i hadn't touched that was having the same issue and the developer while they did not i would have wanted them to add a new class so that it's safely tucked away but they like kind of copied that chunk of code and pasted it into the style sheet but that that's fine the point is like it was very available for someone to see what that was with an algorithm the end css is so cool i know <laughs> okay so css algorithm well-defined declaration or set of declarations blah, 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 that's pretty specific to adding output keywords here well-defined declarations specific so not like when i talk about an algorithm it's not the the, the naming necessarily because there are so many different naming conventions. Well, maybe not that many, but you know, a dozen different naming, that's a lot, a dozen different naming conventions in um, CSS, so kind of depending on the way you've structured your design. So there's like them, there's also suit CSS, there's um, like tachyon, tachyons are kind of like functional CSS, which is very tiny class names, um, many different kinds. So, uh, okay, this slide I should have earlier, I think. Uh, selector, property, value. So this is the names of, this is the, the anatomy of a CSS, that's declaration, rule, rule. Um, and I will say, be very honest, like I think I probably was developing for four or five years before I was like, oh, that's a property, not a value. Okay. I took the time to look this up, but I think it's really important that we use these specific terms and learn what they are. So scale for header theta board ad. This is the algorithm, not even the media query because the media query is kind of calling that little algorithm. So the same as if you have a, a, a math algorithm or something, um, sorting, for example, you don't, you don't include the context of when you sort in the algorithm. Um, some other algorithms in CSS, common ones. Clear fix, something we luckily don't have to use too much, but this is an age old algorithm. It's a pretty specific set of declarations that produce a specific styling output. So ClearFix will do this for our floated element. So it clears its children. Um, algorithm number two, positioning. Outer thing, inner thing. Um, so positioning, yeah, oh, those are, these are some uh, flexible values. What are they? I think they're supposed to, oh yeah, there, that's what our positioning does, okay. Um, aspect ratio, this is a very useful one. So we have a, um, this is my friend's dog named Tuffy. It's kind of like a log. So image container, um, and I want this to be a specific aspect ratio. So I add positioning to the container, padding, and then object fit, and this is like, the, this is a very useful little set of styles. I don't want this to be tucked away in something called um, like featured image. What if I want to use it on someone's profile image? Um, some flexible values. Borders. Borders are pretty cool in CSS. So these are actually the transparent borders. And this is a placeholder slide. Um, how would you all feel about, well, actually, no, I'm going to continue. Sorry. Uh, okay. So I have in, in deadline in the, um, code base, I have a little laboratory, a directory called algorithms, which you probably can't see this very well, but this is our IT CSS structure, which is a CSS uh, architecture to help control specificity. Um, and there's a directory called algorithms. And it was kind of a, I put it there at the beginning of the project being like, mm, let's see if this works. And there's like 20 something uh, patterns in there. And so it definitely made sense to my, mostly me, but also, um, the other like more junior developer who was working on the project would spend a lot of time like pair programming so whenever there was a like a weird a weird uh thing a weird task that didn't really fit in with the rest of the system it kind of became this like oh let's write an algorithm for it like we need to write a very specific set of styles that i don't necessarily want in with the rest of the system 
uh, but I want to keep them somewhere because we, pro I mean, with PMC sites, at least if it's on one thing, it's going to be on something else. So one of these, uh, which is a very useful one, is a glue. We called it the al the glue algorithm, and this is for, like positioning. Uh, but positioning is a concept in CSS that is not that straightforward to get if you haven't written CSS a lot before. So my thought is that this is going to help the backend developers uh, develop a language for talking about styling where they don't, they're not going to be bloating and bloating and bloating the style sheets, but it's like, oh, positioning, we have to do this all the time. Here's a really nice little algorithm, like packaged up, you can use it anywhere. A counter. So this, uh, and also I'm using this custom properties pattern here, probably going to update these to be a little less verbose. Um, a counter. Uh, there's a very cool little grid algorithm that I didn't put code in for. You can look at later. Um, icon. So this is a, a pseudo adding a pseudo element and adding an icon to the pseudo element and calling it icon before because it's adding the icon bef in a before pseudo element, not uh, not the selector itself. So that trying to stick with that uh, naming convention. Overflow, gl overflow grid was another one. Um, there's an algorithm called a become close button, which is, that's what it does. It becomes a close button when you, when, well, maybe it should be become close button on hover. Oh no. <laughs> that's what it does. Um, so CSS algorithm, kind of like a, a lovingly crafted, easily portable utility that does one thing. So we have this notion in, in CSS uh, of utility classes that are reusable in many different places. Um, in our C in our system the utility classes are the single declaration uh classes so that doesn't quite work there so more than what is how you write an algorithm so algorithm interview here are the steps that you're supposed to follow cracking the coding interview plan out your algorithm write a brute force solution do your walkthrough make sure your brute force algorithm works and then you optimize your solution so go back in and add um, different optimization tactics to your brute force code to make your algorithm more performant. Writing CSS algorithms. Hmm, I wonder how these change. They don't. Because it's an algorithm. Why not? So we start out planning with pseudocode. So write, drawing boxes because CSS is boxes. Um, and this has been like the single, and I, I really consider this akin to writing a test too, because when you spend that time before you start writing code to think about, wait, what am I doing exactly? Um, it makes everything a lot better and you kind of have this clear, clear goal as you go. Um, so the second part when you're writing your brute force code and just getting something to work is to not do it in the production code base. I mean, obviously you wouldn't do it on production, but um, don't write it in your actual environment, but write it in a sandbox or in some kind of test bed where um, like this, for example, was an, a grid around an article and the, the kind of author module and the social stuff did like a, some different, um, different things at, at breakpoints and having this in an environment where I could just write that grid code without worrying about local data, without worrying about the slow reload times, um, et cetera, was really valuable. CodePen, of course, is one of these excellent sandbox environments. So. This process, I think, is when you start to get to that, when, you, when your test is like a set of boxes instead of the entire design or one entire component, when it's one tiny thing, then you can start to have this more of a refactor cycle, maybe. Um, okay, Woo conclusion. How are we doing? We're getting this kind of a long conclusion, but it'll be good, hopefully. Warning. Big ideas. Okay, here's a small story time. How Laura came to love computer science. Oh, it's so cute. Okay, so in 2015, I wrote this article for uh, CSS Tricks. So I kind of I started coding in like 2011 or so, like towards the end of college. Um, and I've been working as a developer, as fr freelancing mostly for about four years, and I. Decided I wanted to get a job. 
and I had an interview for a UX engineer slash interaction designer position. I'm like, well, okay, but I kind of hit like 90% of the marks on the job description, on, on the, uh, yeah, job description. And in the interview, they asked me FizzBuzz. So who knows FizzBu FizzBuzz, so. I've Yeah, well, here we go. <laughs> so I wrote this article about um, how, about how weird, how, well, yeah. So, so this was my five page rant about job descriptions on CSS tricks. Um, so I, I was asked FizzBuzz in this interview and I had never, I was kind of freelancing and really on the, the front end side of things and um, had not heard of doing algorithms like this. I'm mostly like very largely self-taught or just kind of learning things on an as needed basis like many, many developers are today. Um, and I was like, you want me to do what? Like, why would you do that? So FizzBuzz is um, for 100 numbers, if number, what is it even? Like every third number print Fizz, every fifth number print Buzz, every third and fifth number, or 15th number print FizzBuzz. And I was like, why would you, why would anybody spend time doing that? That was kind of my thought about, <laughs> that's because I was unfamiliar with this uh, algorithms quizzing kind of thing. So this article, after it was posted, was posted on our programming on Reddit. And the title was changed to designer applies for JS job, fails FizzBuzz, then proceeds to write five page long rant about job descriptions. And I was like, oh my God, okay. But, I mean, there was a lot of people like rallying for me, like, oh, don't listen to the neck beards, like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, whatever. I'm just like not reading those comments. Um, I even had people like I hadn't seen for a long, somebody had, gone on a date with like a couple years ago messaged me he's like oh my god I saw your thing on Hacker News and I was like no <laughs> oh my god like ah. so after this from 2015 to 2017 I was like what I do HTML and CSS computer science not for me like no that I don't need this I'm doing a ton of great I, I'm like making money I'm running like a successful freelancing business and I can build a really good website why do I need to learn this stuff and these people are me so um, then late 2017, this will be a screenshot of a blog post I wrote. Oh, it looks like I messed up my slides a little bit. But. So late 2017, I was like, I got, I got an interview for, a, for, it was a Google interview for a developer relations position for a Word, on a WordPress team. And I was like, whoa, this is like a dream job and Google does algorithms interviews. So fuck, I have to learn, I need to like learn this. And I, spent like I mean I, I was freelancing so I was unfortunate enough at that I mean fortunate not fortunate to be like in between projects when this interview came up and so I was like okay I'm gonna like really learn this and um so I wrote this kind of this series of five or six blog posts about like a lot of different you know very fundamental things about like data structures and algorithms um like binary things I had never really taken the time to learn because I didn't need to because I was building I'm building using tools so, and that was really fun. I was like, my brain was just like lighting up. I was like, this is awesome. I love learning about this. I definitely failed the interview, but like, that's fine. A lot, I can join the failed Google interview club. That's a big club. Um, these are redundant slides. Okay, so 2018 comes around and I proposed this talk for CSS Conf where I was like, I want to bridge the gap between CSS and computer science. Like, I really like both of these things and they seem so disconnected to me. Um, and, see, and computer science is a for me thing. Like, I enjoy it. So what is this bridge between here? So 2018 is kind of figuring that out. And, um, and that's when CSS really went from like, oh, I, I love this and I use it for my work to being like mind blowing. I was like, oh my God, CSS, I can see like all the amazing things happening beneath the surface now that I have this mental model for how computing works more and for computer science and these fundamentals. Oh, I forgot this. Um, CSS, oh. So instead of this as my model, it became more like this, computer science. Everything is part of this big bubble. It's an inclusive term. Uh, yeah, these are just some random other items. Okay, and to top that off, here is FizzBuzz in CSS. <laughs> uh, of course. The end. 
Oh, thanks everyone. Okay, so 2019, here we are now. We're almost done. You guys are great listeners. 2019, is CSS a programming language? No. Like, why is, why is this happening? Like, I, like, what's going on? So, I'm gonna quote uh, someone I met here recently, Dick, who's a computer uh, a programmer who's working um, on some stuff I don't really know about, but it sounds cool. And I was like, this guy's been programming a long time. He definitely knows what a programming language is. I'm gonna ask him about this stuff. And he's like, oh, programming language is, uh, you know, a language for a humor, human to interact with a computer, to give a computer instructions, things to do. I'm like, yes, I know. Why do people think this? What's going on? And he's like, well, well, Lara, when it comes to computer science, there's an 800 pound girl in the room and it's called testosterone. <laughs> That's different from my co-working space. And so I was like, I was like, oh man, I guess. <sighs> um, so there's other, other things like happening right now. So we have that, that's sure, that's a reason. Um, definitely. Uh, has anybody read this article? So this is came out on CSS Tricks, and it was about the great divide between um, like what front end development is. And this is my, my world is kind of this front end, like this tiny slice of what tech is, but front end development. Um, and there are these people like myself who are more specialized in the UI code area. And then there's this massive world of JavaScript and tool, well, massive and like rapidly changing and expanding world of JavaScript and tooling. And so this article is about how there are, it's becoming this split between what front end is and what people are doing. This is another article that was popular recently. HTML, CSS and our vanishing industry entry points. Because now in order to build a website, you need to know how to configure Webpack. You need to know how to do X, Y, and Z other thing. Um, reluctant gatekeeping, the problem with full stack. So this article is about, you know, some similar, similar concepts, concepts where we have uh, full stack developers that don't a lot in a lot of cases don't fully understand the front end and this domain specific declarative um, programming, which is very different from what you write in JavaScript and it's supposed to be different. Another article by Jeremy Keith, who's a great, uh, great person to follow called Split. So the same kind of thing. It's like these two, everything's like, oh, people are becoming divided. So there's this lecture from 1959 called The Two Cultures by C.P. Snow. Um, this was given at Cambridge University, uh, kind of right after the Industrial Revolution. And um, he talks about these two cultures are the arts and humanities and science and how science is in this bubble and people from and people don't understand what each other's talking about and to kind of fix the world and all of this stuff that was happening after the industrial revolution like a lot of um i need to research the history about this a little bit more to, to explain it um but he kind of poses the the concept of um we need more people to from this arts and humanities kind of traditional usual culture side to learn about science so that they can bring these like people oriented human oriented values into this field of innovation and be more of a driving force there so we also have things like this that are happening now so can you all read this so this is like here's how team this is by ProPublica, which is a um publication like politics usually or er, yeah uh here's how team turbo tracks tricks americans into paying each year to file even though they qualify for the pre free product. It involves some creative wording, a harder to find second site and something called dark patterns. So in TurboTax, there's this usability pattern that's making people pay, it's taking advantage of human nature and having people pay for their service when they should be eligible for free, a free uh, tax thing. And of course, then we have things like this like facial recognition algorithms that are like racially biased and this and police are using these algorithms and they're not good and people are being convicted when it's not when the algorithm can't accurately is not good enough to accurately identify their feature because of their skin color and they're being convicted of things because it's not like it's terrible this is very dangerous um i might take out this one this was a Article on a list apart, uh, which is a popular front end web development uh, publication kind of about like the, the dire state of things. So there's some like 
fucked up shit happening. Like, oh my God. So if we think about the two cultures now, and this is kind of my interpretation of it, I'm meshing these things together. So there's kind of code on one end and not code. So not code, we have a lot of things like this. And I'll probably update these to be a little more general rather than like Figma, that's very specific. Okay, so not code tools are people who mainly deal with not code. Um, and this would be analogous to the, the arts and humanities of the two cultures. And code, programming, so technical people. Um, you know, all of our fancy languages, some concepts in there. And HTML and CSS sit like right at this dividing line. They're very close to not code. Uh, I mean, it's like absolutely code, but we're building interface, we're building images and we're building things that people see. So, and they're extremely approachable. Like someone can learn to write CSS in a couple hours right now. Um, and we also have like different values on these uh, sides of the spectrum. So this, you know, on this side, and I'm sure there are uh, negative values here that I'm not, I need to make these look less uh, stark, but I'm sure there are negative values here, but in general, there's like a focus on usability, social connection when you're talking about UX design and UX research, but like pro-human tendencies, maybe a little bit less testosterone. Um, and on this side, bias algorithms, social manipulation, like exploiting human vulnerabilities, testosterone. Um, so maybe, this is my like big idea, maybe HTML and CSS and languages like it, kind of these domain specific hyper approachable languages that sit right at this barrier can be the entry point for people into technology. Um, and this is kind of like based on my own story because I started on this side. I have an art background um, and I did kind of design work and then fell into writing HTML and CSS for a startup and gradually I'm like moving to this side of things. And, and, and every time someone calls me a designer because I write HTML and CSS, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, God damn it. Like, no, I'm really interested in this stuff. And so it's kind of this, there's definitely this energy that's like pushing people away. Um, and it's, I think it's very important. Uh, yeah, so this can happen then. <laughs> and all these nice values that are on the other side can eradicate. <laughs> and that, folks, is an extremely biased idea about how we can save the world. <laughs> Yay, okay, thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.